Jesus. Up here, we're continuing to talk about being anxious for nothing. Basically, how God tells us we're not to be worriers. The church and Christians at large are supposed to be recognized as people who do not worry because we trust God with everything else. But that seems so unreasonable when there's so many things for us to be worried about. Like when you watch the news, like I talked about already, what's going on in world events is rather uh, surprising. We've got Supreme Court rulings on all sorts of things that make a huge difference on our own nation's politics. We've got tornadoes showing up all over and storms around us. This week had all sorts of things that it's easy for a nervous, worrisome person to say, but what about this? What about that? What about this? But God wants every one of us to be able to live free from worry. He says, if you follow me, if you're one of my followers, then worry is for other people. But you're not supposed to have that. You're supposed to inhabit this world where instead you trust God, your maker of heaven and earth, to take care of those details. To just say, God, you've got this, so I don't need to carry it. And as a result, you're able to live in the freedom that he wants for every one of his children. And this morning, we're now at the halfway point in this series, and so I thought it was a good time to recap what we've covered so far. So in the first week, we focused on the promises that are found in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through uh, 9, especially that phrase that the Lord is near. And we recognize that breaking free from anxiety is going to include battles. You don't just say a prayer once and say, Jesus, take this worry and anxiety from me, and instantly you're a new person. Yes, he can do that, and for some people that might be their experience. But for most people, it's going to be more like walking into the promised land, and the Israelites had a whole bunch of battles to fight. But the promise was God would be with them and fight their battles. As you try to push away from this worry and anxiety, it's this promise that God is going to be fighting battles at your side. Then the second week, we talked about how Satan is a liar, and he, he says all these lies in your heart and your mind that keeps you tied up in a ball of worry. And yet... There's these truths that every person dealing with anxiety needs to understand. If you're struggling with it, memorize these four things. If you know somebody who is, write them down and share it with them. First, it's okay to struggle. It's okay to not be okay. You're not crazy. There's not something wrong with your mind. You're going through a difficult time and you're doing it, but you're not alone. So many people feel like they're in this, even in the middle of a home filled with family who cares about them, they feel all alone, but you're not alone when you're going through it. And the final truth you have to hold on to is this will end. Otherwise, you lose all hope for any change. Then last week, we discussed how worship defeats worry because when you worship God, God shows up. And the reason you need to start with worship in your battle is because worship makes God much bigger and it tends to make your problems in comparison much smaller. So we start with worship. And now today we tackle the next tool that God gives us to battle our anxious hearts. And we're walking through Philippians chapter 4 and the next tool that comes up is the power of prayer to bring peace into your heart. And I know prayer is such a basic Christian practice. We, many times we assume, well, everybody knows how to pray. Everybody feels comfortable praying. That's not true. Trying to ask teenagers at youth group, kids who have been raised in the church their whole lives, to pray in front of the group is like pulling teeth because they don't feel confident. Well, what if I do it wrong? What if I don't get the formula right? What if God's not satisfied? What if I embarrass myself? And yet, I also know there's a lot of adults who have those same hang-ups, and it keeps them from being willing to pray. Or maybe, and I think this is more common in my own heart sometimes I feel guilt for this, it's do I actually believe that God's going to do anything about it anyway, or should I just deal with it myself? 
And so as a result, we aren't people of prayer the way that we are supposed to be, the way that God calls us to be and wants us to be. So that's what we're talking about today, how we are to take our requests to God. And this is a topic that's much, much broader than just talking about mental health, anxiety, depression. It applies to every aspect of our lives, but it's especially crucial for those who are struggling with doubt, worry, fear. So we're walking through Philippians 4 as our outline in our series. Today we're going to be focusing on verses 6 and 7. And I know most of you have this memorized by now, right? Raise your hand if you've got it all memorized. No? No? A few of you. Keep working on it. At least keep reading it over and over. I haven't been working on memorizing it, but I keep reading it. And guess what? I probably have 80% of it stuck in here just by the repetitive nature of this. Rejoice in the Lord at all times. And again, I'll say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. I've got that locked in because I keep doing it over and over and over. Now, verses 6 through 7 here are kind of the heartbeat of this passage. These are the most searched verses in many websites and Bible apps. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's beautiful verses. And today we're going to unpack it piece by piece. Because as I was writing down what I wanted to say, I realized what I wanted to say lined up with these two words here and these two words there. So we're just going to walk through it two or three words at a time. Hold on. So, don't be anxious about anything. Like I said, this probably stirs up your anxious thoughts. Like, is there something wrong with me that I'm a worrier? No, this is Paul just laying out. This is the baseline for Christians. We should not be people who sit and worry about anything. So the question is, what do you do with those thoughts? So it's normal to have thoughts pop in like, well, what about this? The question though is, what do you do with those thoughts? Do you sit and let them just percolate in your mind over and over? Do you let them fester? Or do you choose not to sit in the anxious thoughts and instead to let them go? Peter gives us some great advice in his book that he wrote in 1 Peter 5-7 where he says, cast all your anxiety on Him, on God, because He cares for you. Basically, we're all going to have those moments where something comes up and we go, ah! We have that natural fear. Fear is a natural um, emotion that God puts inside of us. We have to understand that. Fear is what saves us from predators and from bears who come running at us. We go, ah, and we know to run away or take our jacket and get really big. I think that's what you do with grizzly bears. And then they turn around. But fear is a natural emotion. The problem is anxiety is when we allow fear to get bigger than it really should be. And we start to let it fester and we don't know what to do with it. And God is saying, go like this. Throw it to the other side of the fence. Say, God, this is not for me. I understand that. I'm casting these cares onto You because I know that You care for me. So don't stew in your anxiety. Let the One who has the power to actually do something about every situation Handle it for you, okay? Understand fear is natural, but it's what are you doing with that fear that matters. Next phrase, in every situation. Really, the Greek's just in everything. So don't be anxious about anything in everything, okay? That means in every situation. So often when we think about prayer, we come to God only with the big stuff. Like, Something small happens in your morning and you spill your orange juice and then you burn your toast and you're running late for work and you're like, oh, this is just a bad day. We don't say anything. We wait for the doctor to call us and say, hey, you need to come in. I've got some really bad news. And then we're like people on our knees 
and in prayer. And for some reason, we have a threshold in our minds of like, well, okay, once it crosses this level of importance, then I'll bring it to God. But otherwise, I'll just deal with it on my own. And I understand maybe burnt toast isn't something that we're praying to God about. But you guys get the point that I'm making here. We wait until it's really big. So if it's a normal week with normal stuff going on, we might be people who rarely go to God with anything because we're like, ah, oh, there's nothing big to take to Him. But he's saying here, in everything, in all that you're going through, in all those little fears that pop up, don't say, well, it's just the big ones that I take to God. The little ones I'll deal with. Bring all of them to God. Perhaps if we had more prayer-filled thoughts, we would have fewer anxious thoughts. Right? In either case, we're locked in our mind with our thoughts. The question is, are those thoughts where we're inviting God into the conversation with us? And we're having a two-way dialogue with these thoughts? And we're giving them to Him? Or are we having those anxious thoughts, those fears in an echo chamber by ourselves? And just allowing the worry to just sit and spin and cycle and work us up and make our hearts start beating faster and our chest start tightening and our palms start getting sweaty. And we're doing it all alone in a room, not sharing it with anybody and especially not God. Okay? If instead we invite God into it with prayer-filled thoughts, we let go of the anxious thoughts in every situation. By prayer and petition. So for fun, I googled the word prayer today. Or yesterday. And now, you know, Google results, they have AI brings together a bunch of stuff it finds on the internet. And it gives you like an AI robot's synopsis of prayer. And I love that it returned an act that seeks to activate a report with a deity. And I thought, is there anything more robotic than an act that seeks to activate a report with a deity? It, it, <laughs> Look, we have to understand, prayer is a gift. Okay, It's an opportunity. The God who made the heavens and the earth, made the entire universe, He spoke it into existence. He can calm the storms. He says, come to Me. I want to help. Jesus teaches us how to pray. He says, Our Father who art in heaven. It's a radical thing when He's teaching His disciples that we don't go to God. Yes, He is otherworldly, transcendent, and beyond what our minds can even imagine. And He's so personal, He knows the hairs on your head. And He wants you to go to Him in the same way that you would go to a loving Father. He doesn't matter... He doesn't care that you keep going to Him over and over. A good dad isn't like, Billy, you've come to me with too many things this week. You need to start taking care of these on your own. A good dad says, yeah, I want to help. And we need to see our Heavenly Father through that lens that in everything by prayer and petition, we go to God for help with this rapport to activate. No, we're not trying to do that. We're in relationship with a God. And we're just saying, Dad, help me. And how do we pray? Specifically, this is where Paul gives us a little um, clarity on what does that prayer and petition look like. It says, present your requests to God. Something I hear teenagers do, and sometimes I'm guilty of as well, is it can be categorized probably as lazy prayer. Okay, so at the end of youth group, we're in small group, and I say, would somebody like to close us? And they'll be like, God, help us to have a good day, and uh, thanks for today. Amen. And it's like, okay, yep, that's a start. But what did you actually ask for? What was the actual request? A good day. Or some people just pray, God, bless my family. Those are fine prayers, but if God actually did something to bless your family, would you recognize it as God's answer to that prayer? Is the prayer so vague and so broad that you wouldn't even know what God's doing in answering that prayer? And I think that there's power sometimes in being more specific. Paul's telling us, bring a request 
What do you want God to do? God, I am worried about this conversation that I have with my boss tomorrow. They can be overbearing and just mean. So God, I pray right now that You would give me wisdom in that situation and how to respond. I ask that You'd give me control over my emotions so that I can stay calm and cool and collected. I pray that You would season my boss's words with kindness so that we would be able to have a conversation that helps us actually come to resolution. Like Those are specifics. So if you walk out of that meeting with a boss that you're expecting it to go sideways and you actually have a helpful conversation, you can say, wow, God did it. Whereas if you just say, God, I'm just worried about this. Help. Help how? You know what I mean? You may not recognize what that help looks like. When we're specific, specific prayers allow God to show us His faithful response. I remember last summer, Leland Shelton in Sunday school prayed specifically, Leland, maybe you remember, he prayed for two inches of rain. He's like, I'm praying for two inches of rain. That week we got just at two inches of rain. Made it really easy to come in that week and be like, God answered prayer, right? We have those moments when you make it specific. It's super easy for God to be like, hey, look at that. I did exactly what you were looking for. And that grows our faith. And when it grows our faith, we become people who are more prayer-filled because we stop being like, oh, God doesn't actually care about it. We say, no, God does care about these things. He does care that I'm living trapped in this world of my thoughts and my worries and darkness and loneliness. God wants you to break out of that. Bring those thoughts, those fears to Him. Make your requests specific to Him. The final part of that request, some people are thinking, well, I I want to be eloquent. I don't want to sound stupid. I want to get the words right. There is no magic formula. Yes, Jesus says, you know, when we ask whatever you ask in my name, so often Christians, we always end it with in Jesus' name. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, But also, if you don't end it with in Jesus' name, it does not render the prayer null and void. Like, we need to understand that. That's not how you as a dad act with your child. That, well, well, little Billy, you didn't say, Dad, if it would please you, so I'm not going to answer. Like, there's no formula to it. We go to God and we say, God, I need help. There is one little caveat that we skipped over as I put those two together. Paul adds in that verse, with thanksgiving, with prayer and petition, Bring your request to God, but it's with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. We are called to be people who are grateful for what God has already been doing in our lives. It's the difference between a grateful child who comes to you and says, oh, there's one more thing can you help with? And that spoiled child who you've done everything for and they're like, ah. PlayStation 3, that's so old. I want a PlayStation 4. Like that child, you're like, that's a brat. I don't want to get them what they want. There's something that you feel the bond more, that connection more, when you know that they're grateful for what you've been doing already. And that's just a natural thing. We understand that in our natural relationships with other people. And that's what God wants too, that we just come to Him and we recognize, God, I got all this mess in my life. And I know that you take care of me. I know that you provide. I know that you protect. And I see that in these spheres of my life. Thank you for that. But God, this situation, I need you to deal with this. This worry in my mind, I need you to take it away from me. And so the reason that this is so powerful that we bring thanksgiving into this is because worry refuses to share the heart with gratitude. If you are a person filled with gratitude. It's hard to be a person of worry because those two things can't sit inside of you at the same time. And so that's why one of the pieces of advice that's really helpful for people who are big worriers is keep a journal of gratitude every day. Write down what you're grateful for that day. Because when you have a heart filled with gratitude, worry can't make a home in there as easily. Because you recognize, no, 
God has provided in all sorts of good ways. He loves me. He cares for me. He's doing good for me. And I'm going to trust Him now with these other things. The result, if we bring our prayers and petitions with thanksgiving to God, the result is that the peace of God Okay, this is not like human peace. Human peace is easily broken. Nations can say they have peace, and then in one person's decision making, it's broken. Marriages can have peace, and one person comes home angry, and they say a harsh word, and kaboom, things blow up, right? But the peace of God is not like that. It is perfect, it is pure, it is beyond what we can understand. It's not at all based on getting everything on our side of the equation right, that we please God in every way and then we can have peace. He wants to offer us this perfect peace that's completely calming, completely unshakable. It can be yours. And it's not just words that I'm saying up here. It's not just words that Paul writes in the Bible. It can be actually experienced. Maybe you've met older saints that just seem to have this perfect calmness and gentleness and trust in God, that no matter what bad news they got, they were fine. When they got the doctor's call that, you know what, You're, you've got this issue and it's not going to get better, they didn't start worrying. As they faced death, they still loved God and had kindness in their heart. That you just looked at them and said, how are you going through what you're going through without being shaken? It's that perfect peace of God that had filled their hearts. And ultimately, Paul clarifies what it looks like. We're told that it's beyond what we can even understand. It transcends or it surpasses all understanding. It's outside of what the world would expect when you're going through that situation. And the beautiful part of that is that what then can make Christians show up different from the world. The world looks at you and goes, how are you going through this situation and you're not worried about it? I've got the peace of God. I know, it's beyond understanding. I shouldn't be able to go through it this calmly. But this is what the Bible promises to me. And this is what I'm experiencing it. And I have freedom from all the worry that other people would be tied up in balls if they were going through what I'm going through or tied up in knots. Um, but I'm okay because I've given it to God. We see a glimpse of that a bit all through Paul's letter to the Philippians. Remember, he's in jail. He's possibly facing death. He has his message being ripped apart in the churches and being, you know, trying to change it and whatnot. And instead, his entire letter to the Philippians is like, just count it all joy. Count it all joy. He has a peace, even in the most dire of situations. God's going to take care of it. I'm fine. Whether in life or in death, whatever, it doesn't matter. I'm good. If Paul isn't, isn't an example of supernatural peace given incredible hardships, then I don't know who is. As you read that book, he exemplifies that phrase that he writes in Philippians 4 there. He then writes, guard your hearts and minds. And I think this is the best part. When we bring our request to God with thanksgiving in our hearts, not only do we receive peace, but we also have a promise that God is going to act as a guard. Why do we need a guard? Because we have an enemy, a spiritual enemy, who's trying to ruin your life. Who is the one who's lobbing those little thoughts in your mind. You're not good enough. You're not going to make it. This is going to fall apart. That conversation's going to go terrible. That person doesn't like you at all. Your marriage isn't going to make it. You have all these little lies being told to you. But when we pray and when we bring our petitions to God, He guards our heart. The best part to fight against anxiety or the best way to fight against it is don't let it take root to begin with. Don't kick it out after it's taken root. Don't let it get there to begin with. That's the job of a guard. That's a lie. That's a lie. That's not true. You're valued. You're loved. You're a child of God. I'll get you through anything. That's the truth of God that can guard those worries from taking root in your life and building into that anxiety. Does that make sense? We follow there? God wants to guard our hearts and minds so that we never fall into the trap in the first place. 
Now, here's the final piece of the puzzle. It ends in, in Christ Jesus. At this point, there are many people who would read this who are not Christians and be like, okay, this is great advice, Ryan. So I will, uh, to have rapport with my higher power deity, you know, in this series, I will put out good vibes to the universe, and then I will have conversation and just speaking out the troubles of my life, and then I will receive a peace. And it's like, no, this is not a promise for all people to do whatever they want in whatever relationship with what they deem as a higher power. Okay? This passage is for Christ followers. This is those in Christ Jesus. God will guard your hearts and your minds. Does it, do we follow? Like, we have to understand. And this is bad news for some people. You might be like, yeah, okay, I want to get over this anxiety, but I don't trust God and I don't believe in Jesus. Well, then this is not your path. Okay? That's the bad news. This promise is for people who put their hope and their trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, who have the Holy Spirit who comes inside of them and is part of this prayer back and forth with God that the Spirit of God inside of us talks to the Spirit of God in the heavenly throne room and we're able to have this conversation. That can't happen if you haven't invited Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior. If you haven't chosen to say, you know what, my life's not working. I'm going to choose to obey and to submit to Jesus and how He wants me to live. Like, that's the requirement here. The good news is, anybody can receive Jesus. You're, it's never too late. You can say, yeah, Ryan, you're right. My life isn't working. How do I make this peace mine? You need to trust in Jesus. It all comes down to Him. If you don't have faith and trust in the man, Jesus Christ, God who came from heaven to this earth, then all of this doesn't fit you. So I encourage you, put your trust in Him. For most of us in this room, we have found following Jesus is the best decision we've ever made in our lives. I've never met a person who's like, yeah, I became a Christian, but man, I wish I hadn't. That doesn't happen. Okay, but for some reason, there are a lot of people, they're like, you know what? I'm doing such a good job driving my own life along. I'm just going to keep doing that. No, I'm saying, no, you're not doing a very good job. <laughs> let go of the wheel and say, God, I need you to take over and let me just follow. Okay, I know talking about prayer seems so basic and yet depending on how you feel and how overwhelming life becomes, praying to God can feel like one of the hardest tasks to do. For some people, you might be like, Ryan, I get it. I'm loaded with anxiety and I know I'm supposed to pray. But when I go home, I feel like I just can't. I feel like there's just a wall. What the heck am I supposed to do? And we have to remember from the very beginning of this series, we've said that winning the war against anxiety was going to require fighting battles. You have an enemy trying to destroy your peace and your joy. This world isn't just a tough place to survive, but it's more and more, I believe that what's going on around us is that we are under spiritual attack. This world is getting really sideways right now. And for some reason we sit and we're like, man, this is just hard. I guess I'll just do it on my own. And it's like, God has said... This is a spiritual battle. It's not, we don't fight against flesh and blood. There's spiritual stuff going on. Not saying that there's a demon under every rock, but let's recognize maybe some of the things in your life have a spiritual aspect to it. And if that's the case, then we need to be spiritual prayer warriors. We need to stop just being Christians who are getting beat up and saying, well, I pray on occasion when life gets really hard. But we need to say, you know what? The Bible calls us to more. And I'm getting fiery about this because I feel as guilty as any of you about this. As I was writing it, I was like, Ryan, how can you be the guy speaking this? Because there's so, it's so easy, even in my role as a pastor, I have lots of time, but guess what? The time gets filled really, really fast. Just like your time gets filled really, really fast. And if you don't make time for prayer, you go through the day and you're like, well, I had a couple minutes here and a minute or two there and a thought that went to Jesus there. 
We're called to more. If we believe that our own mental health battles and the mental health battles of our loved ones, family and friends, is like a spiritual battle, then just saying, God, please help Katie today, is just simply not enough. We're called to more. We're called to get into the trenches and pray for breakthrough for these people that we care about and that we love. God's given us this incredible opportunity and we need to take Him up on it. We have to believe that God can and will answer our prayers. If we don't believe that He cares, if we don't believe He's going to do it, we're going to give up really quickly. But we have got to be people who say, God, this is beyond us and I'm bringing this to You and I'm going to keep bringing it to You because I know You care. I know You're capable of it. I don't know what's going on and why you haven't answered this prayer, but I'm going to continue to trust you. There's a bizarre passage in the Old Testament where somebody's praying and eventually uh, the archangel Michael Gabriel shows up and is like, "Ah, I was at war for three weeks in the spiritual realm. I just got here as fast as I could. Bizarre story. But we have to understand, like, there's stuff that goes on. We don't understand God's timetable. We can't arm wrestle Him or strong arm Him into doing things exactly how we want on our timetable. But we remain consistent and fervent in prayer. It makes a difference. I'm here to tell you, if you're going through struggles right now, this is not the end for you. This is not how your life is going to be indefinitely. God will fight at your side and He will help you achieve victory. It may take longer than you want, but the darkness and the dread can end because greater is He who is in you than he who is in the world. We have to remember that. So, you can do this. Whatever you're going through, however you're feeling, what people you love and care about and you feel like they've been in that position for years, nothing's ever changed, We can do this. We have a role in helping people find freedom for ourselves, for our loved ones. Would the worship team please come up? So, from today, to fight our anxiety, begin with worshiping God. And then with a heart of thanksgiving, specifically cast your anxiety on Him. And tell Him exactly how you're feeling. What you want from Him. Think about what you're worried about. And bring those pieces to Him in detail. And then sit back and trust Jesus to faithfully respond. And now, on a message about prayer, I feel like it'd be remiss if we just ended and I prayed and we sang one song and then we cut out. So we're going to take three minutes. Okay? The worship team is going to pray. Or is going to play. We're going to pray right now. If you have anxiety, you have depression, you have major concerns that feel overwhelming, bring those specifically, authentically, raw feelings and emotions to God right now. If you have people in mind, think about those names. I've got Katie and Bella and Leah and Molly are all in my mind. They're all young ladies I know who are just racked with anxiety. And we're going to take this moment, three minutes, and we're going to pray for those people. If you don't know anybody with with struggles with anxiety, depression, fear, guess what? This message on prayer is really broad. You can apply it to anything in your life. But let's take a moment and practice what it means to be a prayer warrior, bringing our requests to God. So right now, let's just pray. I encourage you, pray out loud even. It's uncomfortable. Maybe it's a whisper. But rather than just in the mind, telling Jesus exactly what it is that you want for Him to do for you this morning.
Heavenly Father, I ask right now that you would answer these prayers, that we would walk back in this room a week from now and we would be able to say, my God met this moment. He answered these prayers. Forgive us, Jesus, of those times that we are prayerless. Forgive us of those times that we're like the disciples or that Jesus calls, oh, you of little faith. God, grow us in our faith and in our belief that you are the only one who can do anything with these situations. That we'd trust you with them. That we'd stop trying to do things on our own. And that we'd say, God, I'm counting on you with this worry. This fear that comes in, I'm throwing it out to you. I'm trusting you. Help us to be people of trust that when the world comes in contact with us, when they see what it is that we're going through, that they're shocked by the peace that surpasses all understanding that's inside of our hearts, that that would be part of our testimony about how you work in our lives and the gift of peace and hope and joy that you offer to all of your saints. We ask these things in your precious name, Jesus. Amen.